Good to have you back here on The Breakfast. Now let's go to, you know, a little bit of history. On this day, May 13th, and I'm going back to the year 1991. Um, a couple of times on the program, we've shared a little bit about Nelson Mandela and his uh, journey towards being uh, president of South Africa. But this morning, we're talking about his wife, Winnie Madikizela Mandela. On this day, she was found guilty of being an accessory to assault um, after about four uh, young men were kidnapped by her bodyguards and people associated to her and beaten you know, up uh, severely. Um, uh, she was a former African National Congress Women League president and was found guilty of four charges of kidnapping for, uh, um, and also being an accessory after the fact of um, assault was leveled against her. Her co-accused, John Morgan, was found guilty of kidnapping and uh, another person, Zoli, Zoliswa Falati, was guilty of kidnapping and assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. The case arose from the fact that one of the kidnapped youths, a 14-year-old Stumpy Sape, had been found dead from the injuries near the crime scene. Uh, the sentencing was scheduled for 14th May 1991, and of course the actual crime had allegedly, allegedly been committed by her thuggish bodyguards uh, who were dubbed the Mandela United Football Club. Mandela's housekeeper and driver were also found guilty of taking part in the kidnapping of the four youths who were suspected of being police informers. They actually were... Um, you know, accused of being police informers. And there's, there's another aspect of it also. Um, it says that uh, she plotted with her co-defendants and, of course, her bodyguards and people around her to discredit a local Methodist minister by abducting four street youths living at his uh, house in Soweto and taking them to a house this, on uh, the 29th of December 1988. Uh, they went further, of course, to harm these guys and beat one of, um, beat one of them and slit his throat which he eventually, well, while well, he eventually died from those injuries um, uh, that were, of course, um, done to him. Um, but anyway, she was found guilty. Some people had also mentioned that maybe it was uh, 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 J.W. Clerk's um, a way to discredit the ANC and to reduce uh, uh, Mandela's chances of becoming president. It was also, you know, conspiracy theories also mentioned, you know, all, you know I mean, there was speculation then that uh, you know, in a bid for, you know, peace in South Africa, in the conversation concerning apartheid, that all of these things, you know, should be swept under the rug and, um, you know, they should allow peace to reign. But, of course, the court case went on. She was found guilty. Um, her lawyer um, um, appealed and she eventually didn't go to jail. Uh, but, you know, it was just a little controversial. A couple of years later, of course, as you know, in 1994, her husband, Nelson Mandela, became president of uh, South Africa. Um, so, yeah. Nobody um, will be able to tell the exact truth of what happened, but you know what the facts are are that uh, her bodyguards had kidnapped four youths in Soweto and dragged them all the way to uh, you know her residence, and one of them died you know in you know the violence that ensued. I'm confused about the story. What was the motive? So it, it's I think they I mean from what it says there was a Methodist priest that they had issues with that probably didn't agree with them, and so they tried to set him up by committing those, you know, crimes and then bringing the boys to, you know, I, I really have no That's idea. That's really weird. You know, how they planned that. Um, but of course, you know, the fact is that they committed those crimes. Like she claimed that she wasn't around when those things were happening. Um, and so she should be let, you know, off the hook, you know, but the judge didn't agree and said that people around you, people that are close to you, allies, your bodyguards committed this crime. So there's no way that you could, you know, claim that you weren't aware or you weren't around hmm. or, um, you know, all of this is, you know, not connected to you somehow, some way. Um, so that's why she, of course, couldn't get off the hook completely. Wow. So th the motive for this allegation really is, is the bone of contention for me because she's someone who's been referred to as mother of the nation. And in the court trial, one of the you know, witnesses said, you know, she stabbed the boy two times and that her hand is dripping with the blood of African children. So it's just the motive for that that I still, yeah. you know, would need to do some more reading on. Um, today in history, she was sentenced to... Six jail. years. Six years. Yeah. Six years in prison. So it's, even the most, even Nelson Mandela, you know, there are people who would also argue that, you know, he might be seen as, um, you know, a promoter of peace and all of that, you know, but there are still some aspects of his journey that were, you know, a little mm -hmm. controversial, you know, where he wasn't all holy and stuff. All right. So um, the day didn't get any better because in 1969 in Malaysia, it was a bloody day today in history, May 13th. And... Uh, the issue really is, is, a, is a very long history regarding Malaysia because 
we know that the, the country um, you know, has a minority you know, Chinese Indian population, but obviously the Malays are the majority, but they were poor and um, they lived in the rural areas. You know, they concentrated you know, on agriculture and farming, but the minority Chinese in Malaysia you know, controlled the economic powerhouse of the country. They were very wealthy. So there was this disparity between the minority Chinese and the majority Malays in Malaysia. And um, the thing in Malaysia was that, you know, political parties were formed along ethnic lines. So there was the Chinese political party, the, you know, Malay political party, and all of that. And uh, we know that despite the... Um, the fact that these Malays, you know, they were poor, they lived in the rural areas, they actually controlled, you know, the political strength of Malaysia, controlled the military, controlled, you know, just these basic things. It's just that the Chinese were more, were wealthier, you know, when you talk about economics. So for years, the Chinese had been succeeding in, you know, winning the elections, but the opposition party won the elections, you know, in that year, in 1969 in Malaysia. They embarked on a victory parade and then there was an opposition parade to that. And that's what basically caused the clash this day in history, May 13, 1969. We saw, you know, <clears throat> news sources talking about hundreds of people dying. And, um, you know, other sources say about 600 people died, about 430, 39 people injured as a result of that clash. Several houses were demolished to the ground. It was just a very bloody situation, and, and it didn't just happen in one day. It, it, it set off a process of riots in Malaysia. You know, Malays burned cars, they burned shops, they killed, they looted. I mean, you can see on your screens there just uh, a glimpse of what the protests and riots looked like back then in Malaysia in 1969. It went on till about 1971 when the government, you know, obviously when that happened, we know that parliament was suspended, military took over, curfew was, you know, declared state of emergency in the country it was just a lot and then after that situation it decided you know let's restructure the country uh, in such a way that Mal Malaysians you know have more access to education more access to you know the economic wealth of the country and um, that basically sums up what happened today in history it was the beginning of the Sino Malay sectarian violence in Kuala Lumpur Malaysia all right and uh, the good part of all of this is uh, after that of Malaysia, uh, Malaysia. Um, malaria. Then, uh, malaria. <laughs> <laughs> malaria then rose to become, you know, the country that it is today. You know, mm -hmm. so they went through their difficult times. They went through their crisis. Went through their, you know, uh, uh, periods of violence and, you know, uh, and, um, um, you know, all of that. You know, but you look at how far they've come. You know, since that. You know, since the sixties, seventies, eighties to where they are today. Nigerians. And their thousands uh, are, of course, are thrown in, uh, moving to Malaysia every year. Uh, for to try, education, course, uh, especially. Yeah, and for other purposes. But uh, let's, let's focus on the education aspect uh, of it. But um, it, it's just to share that they will still have a, a success story to share um, after all these years. Anyway. So that's what happened today in history, uh, May 13th, 1991 and 1969. Absolutely. Stay with us. We're moving into our first major conversation for today. Uh, the end SARS protest, October 2020, was, of course, uh, the peak of that protest. Uh, there's been numerous conversations about what happened on that day, October 20th in 2020. Um, did people die? Were people injured? What got the army involved? At what level did the army get involved? Um, there's further conversations going on even after the panel that was set up and we're getting into that after video uh, clips were released showing multiple incidents that took place on that day. We'll get into that after the short break. <laughs> 